guys, it's GM Max here, and this is going to be a really funny Crazy House game, played by Opa Wesson, who, for those of you who don't know, Opa Wesson is international master Vincent Rothfries from Belgium, and actually he's the Crazy House world champion of 2018 and 2019, so a very strong and very creative player who often likes to go his own way in the opening, and if you're wondering what exactly the double rover is, well, we see it in this game, where the single rover, for those who are wondering, is where you play A4, or a move like H4, and then do a Rook Lift at the very start of the game, like Rook A3. It's kind of funny, because it's like a beginner's opening as such, where, you know, if you remember the first games of chess you played, maybe you thought, let's play A4 and get the Rook into the game very fast. Of course, it's a very bad opening in Crazy House as well as in normal chess. And something like just normal D5, and even some normal London sub is going to leave white with some, you know, completely ridiculous position. Okay, it's true, E5 is probably even better again in this case. You know, I can try Rook E3 or Rook G3, but obviously you don't need to be a genius to get a winning position against such lines. Uh, so after A5, well, instead we had Rook A3, Rook A6, and so we see the double rover, because Legion Destroyer, who actually is also a very strong Crazy House player, I think has been 2650 plus in his peak. Well, he decides to copy White and do the double rover back. And this sort of, yeah, kind of where the game starts to, well, get at least slightly more normal. Not, not by much. I mean, the best move by his players is to go e4 and knight c3 and, you know, maybe try and harass the rook. But instead, white decides to trade voluntarily. Uh, okay, I guess this gave way that white won the game. But I guess you kind of knew that already from my description. So after rook f6, actually, black should probably go knight, takes f6 and develop the knight actively. But he goes e f6 and Opperwaze again shows creative spirit with the move rook a8 at a8. I mean, it's the kind of position where, I mean, when you look at this, well, you sort of think, okay, there's no way that this can possibly be any good in such a, such a position. So I'm uh, just fixing up this uh, this thing here. Okay, so you can see the material now. Oh, it's always glitches come with the V. like, you'd be surprised how many retakes I have to do of each of these. But anyway, after knight c6, we can't see the rook. It's very active on a8, but it doesn't really do that much in reality because the rook queen is defending the bishop. So at knight c3, black playing knight h6, also playing kind of meme I think they're just bishop b4, knight e7, d5 castles. Well, this would kind of leave the rook looking ridiculous. And the fact that black still has the rook in hand to play later in the game is definitely a big help here. Uh, well, the game's on knight h6, knight f3. And now knight g4, where he's trying to attack this weak pawn on uh, f2 somehow. Uh, but I played d4 to stop that. And I probably could just play e4, to be fair. I think bishop c5, d4 is a pretty solid reply. But okay, d4 is kind of the safety forced continuation. The reason I think this might not be the most precise is I think bishop to b4 is kind of an annoying pin and it's not so easy to get out of this in a very comfortable way. So Opperwaisen decides to just ignore it and play the move e4. And this actually is a point where I think that black missed quite an interesting opportunity to take the initiative that is suggested by the computer. Where in a game black's played castles and developed normally, but I think that in such positions it's very interesting to play a move like d5. And over at d5, it is a very computer-like idea, but the point is that if white were, let's say, to play ed5, which is kind of the obvious move here, well, now the move of basically castling, I think, is even more effective now than it was before, because if white does take, well, now you can play bishop takes. It turns out the open e-file really helps black for the attack after knight takes f2, where obviously if black's able to take the rook or the queen, this is just fantastic, but... If you play knight king f2, we go knight e4. And now we see why it was good to throw in bishop takes c3 with check. So that we get the knight to drop on the king. Now after king e3, knight c3, well, the rook is coming in the attack. Black still has two pawns and a rook in hand to drop on different places. Like, for example, queen d3, like even a move. Such as pawn e4 and just kind of exchanging off the white defenders and just dropping them back on the board is going to be very strong. Uh, but instead we had the move castles and... Well, in that case, after bishop d3, white sort of is now defended, where d5 doesn't have as much sting as before when the e4 square is covered by the bishop. Actually, in this position, maybe the best option is actually to play some move like rook b1 and kind of do the pin back on white, just to keep white tied up in that way. Because you never know when it's going to be useful to sack the rook for the bishop later in order to, well, have good play on the dark squares. Because after all, as you know, Crazy House is a very, let's say, color complex sort of game in that it's all about you know being able to play on one particular color complex and dominate on in a lot of positions so after d5 now i play the move rook c8 again a very typical sort of opera wesson kind of move saying okay i'm going to just get rid of the uh the bishop and try to grab material objectively speaking no bishop f5 is a mistake and i think that would have been better to go ed5 
And then to not fear the attack with the rook, because now you've taken the pawn, you do have the option to kind of drop a pawn on the e file to guard your king in that way. Uh, but I played bishop f5, and it's one sort of mistake actually I see quite a lot in Kratos, sometimes even at higher levels, is that players will sort of misevaluate the importance of material. Because it might seem after queen f5 and e f5 that, okay, white's up a queen and is doing great. But the reality is that black's drops are a lot more useful. In such a close position, a queen is not really going to help all that much for what black. In fact, in this position, maybe you should put the rook on e7 on the board directly, I think. He played the move rook e8 instead in the game, but I think that the reason that this is going to be better is that, well, you sort of just have more material on the board. So after bishop c3, if white does take... Well, black can even play moves like knight takes f2, and you kind of see here that, well, black's just able to drop the piece on the board with tempo. And it turns out bishop at e3 is really powerful here, because if white does take, and I mean, if he doesn't, he's kind of getting destroyed anyway, but... Now we can kind of see how in Kray's house it's very good to be able to drop the pieces on the board with tempo. And with this combination, black's sort of able to also not give white the time to drop his pieces on the board. Meanwhile, the dark squares are very weak for white. And after queen e1 and knight g4, well, black's going to put a pawn on f2, maybe even just take the queen if he allowed. And it's just going to be a completely hopeless position for white as his king is just way too exposed. Uh, so... There's a very good example of the initiative and the king's safety being more important than white having more queens on the board. Uh, and it's one thing to be able to have the pieces in hand, but it's not that good if you can't get them actually down on that board. So after rook e8, white played king f1. And now black played rook at a1. Again, I think that the idea of playing bishop c3 and trying to go for the attack would make a lot more sense. One big difference, though, is that now after bc3... Actually, to be fair, in this position, knight f2 is probably still very strong. I think the same idea still works here. I think one difference here is that maybe Y is not forced to take that bishop. Because often a common mistake that even I sometimes make have made in Crazy House, where I assumed A is have to recapture, and then A so surprised me a different move. I and mean, Queen at G3 would actually be not so clear, because then the knight is kind of trapped, and maybe it's still very good for black, but a point is, of course, knight six runs in the takes, and well, at least the position remains kind of more complex if black has to drop some piece in order to defend his knight on G4. But anyway, black played rook to A1. Uh, and white played knight takes d5, and this kind of shows why rook a1 was sort of, I think, uh, a mistake here. Because black is not getting in the rook to c1, and also the knight is even quite useful. Sometimes you're going for an attack yourself. So again, went knight takes d4, and okay, the idea is to meet knight takes d4 with rook at e1, and mate on the back rank. But now Opperwes and found a very great move to both defend and attack at the same time. Can you find that move as well with white to play? Okay, well done if you realise that the key, the best way to defend is to attack. You know, that's very often true in Crazy House. And what well, Opperwes did with the move Pawn at E6. If you want to play Pawn at G6, that move is actually probably even better. But Pawn E6 is the same idea. Well, you're interfering with the Rook and you're able to take the Knight later. So it's a very practical move. And well, also a point that it's very hard for Black to really defend in such a position. Because if you do try to sort of defend that square, White's just going to keep dropping... And it's obviously this idea quite a lot in high level crazy house of just recycling on the one square and just pounding that square with new drops each move until you basically black runs out of material or you just have enough material to win. So after knight takes f6, this is what happened in the game. And the rest was pretty straightforward. You know, this game did go on for a very long time. Uh, yeah, actually, when they went to move 30, so let's see it to the end. So king h8. I guess move 30 for some people is a long time in crazy house. Like, it's sort of... Yeah, it reminds me like in normal chess how everything's like the Budapest Gambit or the Stafford Gambit. It's like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to win or lose, but I'm pretty sure I'm just going to get either a crushing win in under 20 moves or I'm going to get to lose painfully in 30 or so moves. And Crazy House can often be like that, that often the confrontation happens very quickly and then from there, like, the game is just over for someone. And that's kind of what happened here as well. I mean, Queen takes F8, I think, was sort of unnecessary. I think that you could safely play G takes F3, because the queen itself is actually not that helpful for black. And of course, rook takes c8. Does run into knight f7. And you know this is sort of a, an important point that really the queen wasn't actually under threat. So queen f8 kind of ends up being sort of superfluous. And after queen takes f3, like it's sort of ain't quite lucky that white is still winning in his position with rook to d1. That the threat of knight f7 and rook at h8 mate just sort of doesn't give black the temper that he needs to sort of go for the big attack on the white king and put the piece on the board. I mean, for example, knight at d2 and then knight takes f3 would be winning if it wasn't for this mate threat. So after rook takes d1, queen takes d1. Well, it was pretty easy from here. You know, knight f7 and takes, takes. 
Knight h6, and here Opa hasn't just set up a mating idea with bishop at e6. Knight e7, and now rook g8. And so a nice point that you, know, you often see this combination normal chess, like queen at g8 and, and knight f7 mate. And then we see it in Crazy House with the knight f7 checkmate here as well. So yeah, it's a very entertaining game. I have to admit it might seem a bit weird to analyze such a game when, well, the players were kind of mucking around in the opening and not really, let's say, playing their proper moves. But still, that's a very interesting battle and certainly it's kind of fun to see these meme and joke games as well to remind us of why we love chess and that there are often a lot of possibilities beyond what we might assume are exist in a position. It's always good to look for alternatives and see, well, is there a better move than the first one that comes to mind before making our decision. Anyway, uh, if you like this video uh, and if you learned something new from it, then certainly like the video and also consider subscribing if you're new to the channel to keep up with more of my chess content. With that being said, I'll see you in the next training video for more high-level Crazy House games. Until next time, have a good one.